Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. It is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. Uh, I'm, I'm joined today by someone who uh, has reached legendary status in his life and in his career. In many, in many regards, the equivalent of uh, Tony Fauci in the United States, al although he has a different role. I'm joined by Peter Piat. Uh, Peter is a director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, founded in 1899, uh, likely the preeminent school of public health in the world. Um, Peter is the Hanna Professor of Global Health. He's had many, many positions. He's often referred to as a virus hunter, which we'll talk about in a bit. And he discovered the Ebola virus in 1976 and for the last three or four decades has been intimately familiar with virtually every pandemic that's occurred uh, worldwide. Peter, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Pleasure, Howard. Good to see you again. I should say that I was part of the team that discovered Ebola virus. That's true. I was I was it's not it's always nice when people give appropriate credit. Um, so, Peter, we'll, we'll get into some of the more nuanced questions about the new variants and the vaccine and how things are going in your, particularly in your home city of London. But, Peter, when you look back at the last year now, we're a year, actually, from the first uh, publications in, in uh, JAMA New England Journal and Lancet, what, what strikes you? What do you find most striking about this pandemic? Well, Howard, on the one hand, um, I've been given talks for since the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, and the title was "Are We Ready for the Next right. Pandemic?" Yeah, and uh, it, and the answer, the conclusion was no. And uh, uh, people like you know in, in in our field, and Tony Fauci did the same, Bill Gates, and so on. Uh, we were all convinced that one day there would be a big epidemic. Ebola was just a kind of a rehearsal yeah. um, and uh, something that is respiratory transmitted and uh, and then would, uh, you know, infect millions of people. But uh, I made one mistake. I thought this was going to be an influenza virus, yeah. a new like Spanish flu types, uh, but it was a coronavirus. Um, and now just talking about the UK, two days ago, we reached the a really very, very sad milestone of 100,000 deaths um, in the, just in the, in the UK. Um, and so it was not a surprise that it came, but it's a big difference between, uh, how to say, an intellectual conviction that this would happen and when you're confronted with it. And, um, and that it spread so fast all over the world. Um, I must say the, the, the thing that is most unexpected for me was that I caught it myself. Right. Uh, so I've, yeah, I've been dealing with viruses uh, either as a clinician or, you know, uh, epidemiology outbreak investigation most of my professional life. But I, yeah, this time I got it also. Um, and uh, the one thing that maybe surprised me the most, certainly in the beginning, is that uh, it's not because something is respiratory transmitted that it's just a respiratory infection. For some reason, I all I concentrated in the beginning on the lungs, but we know that SARS-CoV-2, the virus, invades and can affect about any body organ, and that it's we should look at it as a, I know, a total um, infection of the whole body. I mean, it's like a bit like HIV, where I have spent a lot of my right. life. Uh, if today you are treating someone with uh, with HIV, you need to know your whole internal medicine. It's not enough. To, to be, and that's a sexually transmitted infection. So it's so that's uh, for me was uh, from a clinical perspective, uh, something I hadn't fully um, realized in the beginning. Peter, were you surprised? Uh, I mean, we published a research letter, Lancet published a research letter, uh, Nijem published a research letter all in February around asymptomatic spread. There were some questions about the validity of some of the reports. Um, I don't think the journals did as good a job as we might have about saying what that meant. Have you, were you surprised about what has clearly become the extent of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread? Uh, not really, because um, just by extrapolation for 
nearly all viral infections have a asymptomatic um, proportion. I mean, some more than others, and uh, with some exceptions like rabies or so. But uh, the rest, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, respiratory infections. And of course, we have really asymptomatic, and then we have right. pre-symptomatic. And in the beginning, that was not so clear. Uh, you know, it's also true that uh, uh, you're often most infectious just before you, right. you know, uh, develop your symptoms. Um, but it is probably one of the main reasons that uh, the virus is spreading so fast. And that in, and that's where uh, already if early March, I, I remember, I, I said, you know, I gave a talk and I said, masks are so important. Yeah. And yet there was a big debate. That yeah. was one of the... I found one of the most frustrating things yeah. where sometimes uh, we scientists, we, the enemy, you know, the, what they say, the best is the enemy of the good. good we yeah. want evidence from randomized controlled trials, preferably in our own country, etc., and the published in, in peer-reviewed journals before we, uh, you know, we accept something. But there, uh, this is uh, particularly when you have asymptomatic transmission, the, you need measures that are not uh, triggered by um, by disease, by illness. And uh, I mean, there is social distancing, uh, you know, testing, but uh, for many months and, and even today, uh, some countries uh, only will um, accept testing of symptomatic people, symptomatic contacts, not asymptomatic ones. And honestly, that doesn't make sense. And particularly now that the evidence is, uh, is so strong. Was it a missed opportunity, Peter, when you look back? You know, we had we had gotten so many uh, viewpoints from Asia saying, we're just asking you to wear a mask. It's not like we were asking you to take an exotic drug or to put your life at risk uh, because of a, uh, a an unusual treatment. It was just a mask. Do you think that was a major missed opportunity around the world in February and March? I really think it was a missed opportunity. I'll never forget, first time I went to Japan was in 1980 or 81. And uh, it was in Kyoto and in the street, I saw people with a, with a mask. And I thought, mm, people here are paranoid about germs, you know, like germophobes and so on. But then someone said, no, 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 wait a minute. This is just an altruistic way of behaving. Just when you have a, your nose drips, or you have a cold, you cough, you wear a mask and it's to protect the community. And that actually, historically, you know, that, that goes back to the Spanish flu. So it's about 100 years old. And I hope that this epidemic will yeah. also, uh, you know, uh, induce that kind of um, civility so that we are protecting the community. And, and it hardly costs anything. It's not a burden. And in nearly all countries, it's not a political issue as it became at some point in the U.S., yeah. Here it's not. I mean, some people don't like it for other reasons, but it's not along political lines, at least, which is pretty absurd, frankly. I mean, there's dozens of reports of almost no flu this year in many countries. Yes. You know, we've yeah. had almost no circulating flu. I mean, we ended yeah. up with major problems in the U.S. in the fall, but it wasn't what people had thought it would be, which would be this combination yeah. uh, of COVID-19 and the flu. It was just COVID-19 uh, alone. Uh, obviously, uh, the great scientific achievement are the two vaccines to date, and there's more coming. The uh, uh, UK is, uh, uh, um, has three. J&J &J may be approved in the U.S. in the coming months. That, that, that's the hope. That's been unequivocally the great scientific great. achievement. I, I think there's been some nice clinical advances, although they're still complicated about which treatments work, which don't. I think we know steroids is the standard of care. After that, I think there's much uncertainty. What, what do these new va variants mean to you, uh, um, Peter? I know you're not an e evolutionary biologist, but it's they've really emerged quickly. They've emerged in the midst of uh, partial vaccination, many different treatments. W what is your sense of how this the issue of these variants will play out, Peter? Well, viruses mutate, certainly RNA viruses. That, that's, this shouldn't be surprised to anybody. I was actually surprised that it uh, took so long, but partly we, should, we know already that even very early on out of Wuhan, there was a particular variant that became dominant. And uh, I always try to put myself in the 
the head to say so of the micro. This is, I did part of my PhD work with Stanley Falco when he was uh, at Seattle at University of Washington. And we worked on bacterial pathogenesis. And he said, put yourself in the head of the, of the, of the bug, you know, and, and then that makes you think. And what is, what's the raison d'etre of a virus? It's to find a host and to replicate because they can't survive without uh, living cells. And uh, so uh, they mutate, and now and then there is one mutation, one variant that has an evolutionary advantage that will be easier to infect, and that becomes dominant. And um, the first one that was found was in the in the UK, and that's, well, I think well, to a large degree because in the UK about 10% of all um, positive samples for PCR samples uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, are actually um, sequenced to a certain degree. So there's, wow. a, there's a whole capacity. And uh, of course, the more you sequence, the more variants you will find. And uh, now you've got in Southern California, in Ohio, right. Brazil, uh, just name it, South Africa. And soon every state and every country will have their variant. And uh, the question is, of course, um, what do they uh, lead to? Um, historically, um, it could be a, probably a good thing that uh, we've seen that with other coronaviruses, the one that uh, caused common cause, uh, cold, um, probably uh, about 100 years ago or longer, they may have been va- far more virulent. Today, they're kind of cause a, a common cold. But here, I'm very, very concerned about these variants. Um, and that may only be the beginning, uh, in the sense that the big question, of course, is will uh, the vaccines uh, protect against infection with the variants. Um, I think at this, it won't be an all or nothing type of game. Right. That's unlikely. Um, but it could be, mean diminished um, uh, effectiveness at the population level. And uh, and one day there may be a very nasty one that's, uh, that's so changed uh, because we're all uh, using the same vaccines at the moment that are directed against the a spike protein of the uh, of the virus, and uh, so this. First of all, we need to to know to know early. The good news, I would say, is that um, the it's the same measures, the same non-pharmaceutical interventions that work. I mean, here in the UK now, uh, this uh, week we had about twenty thousand new infections coming down from oh, seventy thousand um, about a month ago, and. So we're using the same methods, and that means that in, in this British variant, which is between 30 and 70 percent more um, transmissible, uh, that 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 works as well. But it means that you know we have to continue to um, you know respect all the rules, all the measures. Uh, we can't relax. And then the vi- the vaccines. That's uh, we need to prepare for um, variants that won't. Uh, you know, respond to to the current vaccines, and and that's a for me a top priority. So I'm also I'm, I'm advising the European Commission, uh, uh, President Ursula von der Leyen, and it's a top priority is to see how can we um, speed up um, potential um, additional um, vaccine versions, or do we need to go to multivalent vaccines? Uh, are we going to get into a situation like for influenza? Is there a finite spectrum uh, of um, these mutations and that we can come to a system like we have for influenza where right. we can more or less predict and maybe artificial intelligence and so can and can help us? Let's not forget this. We are still in early days, early days. This yeah. is a, a year old. I mean, it's a fantastic, the progress we've made. Um, you know, but it's also it's even... Uh, worse, the, the, I mean, the, the progress that the virus has made is still uh, you know, worse than the scientific progress, but we are getting there. Peter, do you think in terms of vaccine development, one, one of the uh, approaches to consider are vaccines that are active not necessarily against the spike protein, that, that um, if, if a variant arrives that somehow it, it is more resistant to the vaccines that focus on the spike protein, that there'd be another vaccine available is, is when you think out six months or a year, because it will still take a year to develop a, a different approach. 
Do you think that's important to consider or we just need different approaches? Adenovirus, heat killed, mRNA against the spike protein. Or do we need both approaches? I think we need both approaches. Uh, we, I mean, let's also face it, mRNA vaccines, this is new. This is right. first time. It may revolutionize the whole you know, vaccine development, but we don't have enough experience. But we know that it's easy to develop a vaccine with right. that technology. But uh, what people tend to forget sometimes, it's not enough to uh, develop a prototype or a candidate vaccine. Then you have to go through some basic immunogenicity, safety, uh, just name it, and then you have to, uh, you know, to, to manufacture it. And I think at the moment, in terms of uh, vaccination, certainly in Europe, manufacturing is the big bottleneck yeah. at the moment, at go to scale. Uh, and that's a bottleneck for Europe, and that's a bottleneck for, for Africa, and so on. However, I, I, I think that we need to follow at least two paths. One is that um, making sure that the current vaccines, that we can uh, have a system for, let's say, business continuity. If I were in charge of the company, uh, that we can, we're ready now, even before it's really necessary that we put everything in place, that the regulators, the FDA and uh, the EMA, that they have criteria just as for an influenza vaccine. What are the correlates of protection? We don't know yeah. fully, but you know, we already know that neutralizing antibodies are there. But then also, I think we need alternative um, vaccines. For example, if you know uh, subunits, uh, peptide vaccines, you can you can imagine a cocktail um, that uh, includes uh, several targets uh, for the of the virus. And uh, I, I in the beginning, I kind of um, um, was not so high on um, the classic inactivated. Uh, Vaccines, you yeah, know, the China. Uh, I mean, those are the more the Chinese yeah. vaccines. Yes, indeed. But there's also some others, and uh, you know, uh, on Neva, for example. And uh, but then I, now I start thinking, hmm, maybe that's uh, uh, we should definitely uh, look at that uh, very seriously because they will, um, you know, trigger a much broader uh, type of immune response. So yeah, we'll see. Peter, um, does this? wake you up in the morning and are you worried about this oh yes definitely uh, not only in the morning but sometimes at, at night, night. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 yes no i um how to say this on the one hand i you know i was convinced it would happen but that doesn't but now is um you know what to do about it and it's not going to be by closing borders that we're going to fix this to be honest um, because the, the variants will pop up everywhere, yeah. particularly when millions of people are infected and with the rate of, uh, uh, you know, mutation, it's going to happen. And then one issue that I'm very concerned about is that here in the UK, that the um, interval between two injections of the um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is, you know, 12 weeks. There are no, yeah. there are no data. We could uh, have suboptimally protected people, which right. is, of course, wonderful for to develop, uh, you know, um, escape mutants. It's a breeding ground. I may be wrong, but nobody knows. Right. Uh, it, you've yeah. touched on a, a difficult issue in the U.S. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, Paul Offit, who's outspoken about this, uh, I think. Uh, Tony's weighed in on on this. They are very uncomfortable. I, I I mean, they're willing to go from three weeks to four weeks or four weeks to five weeks. They are not proponents of uh, of uh, uh, moving out to eight weeks or twelve weeks between uh, yeah. shots that are meant to be given at three and four weeks because of the lack of data. And um, uh, they'd rather have fifty million people protected. Than a hundred million who may not be protected at all, and it's a, it's a compliment. It's a complicated equation. People have been struck by the UK. You have many, many brilliant people. So I would say, in the US, the general sense is one of surprise. Yeah, but I'm with Tony and Paul on this. Uh, I mean, I think like six weeks. That's uh, you know that that's doable. I think because also in the trials, certainly with right, the, some data. the vaccine, there was somewhere in there. So, um, but. Uh, I mean, you can even say, you know, why bother doing all the trials if uh, if you just ignore the evidence? And uh, but theoretically, the, the the risk is also very high for escape mutants that that's a breeding ground. And in addition to 
uh, you know, insufficient protection, the, the level of uh, neutralizing antibodies that are um, found after the first injection with the, with the mRNA vaccine is very low. Of course, there is protection already after one uh, injection, no doubt about that, the, the, the data there, but for how long and so on. But it's very it's fascinating how the same data um, are interpreted in completely different right. ways by different scientists. And, uh, and but here in the UK, it's been, I understand it. I mean, there's a crisis. I mean, as I said, uh, every day, like 1500 people die. Um, but um, I'm concerned that it's, uh, as we say, in my, my mother tongue is Dutch, you know, pan, playing panic football in soccer, you know, you, you go into all directions. And that the, what looks like making sense in the short run, and it does make sense, the short run, could be really um, creating more problems in the long run. Um, so I, I'm, all, I'm absolutely not in favor of that. Six well, weeks, my, yes, that's uh, fine. No, no, no. We've been fortunate in the U.S. The numbers of hospitalized patients, which is what I really follow. The number of cases is important. So I follow the number of deaths and hospitalized yes. patients, but particularly yes. hospitalized patients, because that's who dies has really finally come down in the U.S. We were about 100, 135,000 a day. We're down to about 100, 110,000. Uh, I'm wondering that uh, if those numbers get better in the U.K., and I know that they are getting better, if that will make people think twice about lengthening out the vaccine. Because I, I think the decision to lengthen out uh, or, or uh, to, to uh, two months or three months was made in the midst of this overwhelming number of patients who were in the hospital. And you've already mentioned that that's gotten better. And I'm wondering if that will make people reflect, maybe we should go back to a much more standard approach. But um, I, I, I don't have to make the decision. I only get to comment on it. And that makes my life much easier. Yeah, same here. I'm not uh, deciding that. No, I, ho I hope the same. I mean, there are several factors. Uh, one, the, the, the vaccination program in the UK is quite, is quite good, I must say. I mean, after the massive failures of test and trace and, and, and of the whole response has been quite bad uh, and, and in, insufficient and always too late. Um, but uh, the vaccination rollout has been really well organized. It's not yet at cruising altitude. And once it's there, I hope that, you know, and, and, and if the supply of the vaccines uh, is sufficient, I, I hope that they will come to uh, what a more science-based, evidence-based type of, uh, of approach. And uh, the number of cases are going down. The hospitalizations are still not going down, but that's then a matter of time. There is a lag time of uh, several weeks. And even in the, the rest of, the, of Europe, uh, because the, the UK is still is part of Europe, right? not because there is Brexit, um, there is a... Um, First, I mean, the decline is starting now, uh, but as a result of draconian, um, you know, lockdowns and all that, so um, it, it is coming down. Yeah, I would describe the vaccine rollout in the U.S. at best as erratic, and that may be kind as an initial description. It's interesting. Uh, the, the data are pretty overwhelming. The rural states have done uh, better than uh, the non-rural states. Okay. And, you know, it took a while, but I think the hospitals managed to vaccinate healthcare workers. But we have really struggled outside of hospital systems. Peter, I, I wanted to reflect. I think, you know, you've been public that you were infected in March. You've been quite public about it. Um, and we talked a little bit about it uh, before uh, we started the live stream. Before we get to, to your own disease. And I think that always is so meaningful to hear from people about what it was like for, for them. Where, where is it, where's your sense where we are with treatment? You know, early on, there were some reports of the value of remdesivir. It, it was really, they were, it was not very effective. And I've spoken to my European colleagues, my U.S. colleagues, not very popular in Europe at all, uh, more popular in the U.S. Uh, we have yet to figure out if convalescent plasma is very effective. There have not been really uh, high quality clinical trials where we know the titers, when it was given, was it given for prevention or treatment? Um, I think steroids, uh, the recovery trial, and we had three RCTs and a meta-analysis from WHO. That's definitive. Where do you think we are on treatment, um, Peter? And will we ever know or is the disease so variable in people that that makes it more complicated what's your, what's your sense of treatment 
Well, the, as much as we've, uh, you know, the, um, the development of vaccines was frankly beyond my expectations. Uh, that uh, right. particularly when I saw the uh, over 90% efficacy yeah. of the mRNA vaccines, that was such a, I mean, wonderful. And and uh, and we we have more. We're going to have more vaccines. So that's what. I've been really disappointed by um, progress on treatment. Yeah. And um, I thought a lot about it. And, and I think that probably what's key is timing is going to be everything. When do you give what um, yeah. to whom? And, um, uh, that, and that's, um, that's not every, always popular with people who into clinical trials, but we'll have to do look into subgroups. And uh, it makes sense that antivirals, be it monoclonals or um, small molecules, um, will have to be given pretty early on, um, like for most viral infections, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the, the key will be when to start with, um, like, say, dexamethasone um, or other uh, immune suppressants or uh, immune modulators, whatever you can try. Um, and and you know, if it's too early, maybe it may be, you know, uh, causing harm. And if it's too late, uh, it's too late because the, the impact of immune um, modulators and all that is that that takes quite some time. So um, that's the, that, that I think that may be the, the big challenge for the for trials and to see. So it's time now to uh, take, I think, some stock and say, OK, can we see a system um, of um, you know different stages of the disease and when to to apply what? Um, because that makes it also so hard to compare trials, and that's where people get very passionate because they it's nearly a belief. Yes, every I'm not saying every drug, but lots of uh, therapists they have a trial that shows that it works uh, to some degree. Um, rarely spect in a spectacular way. And then there's another trial, so nothing, you know, no impact. Um, and uh, and it's not that these are badly conducted trials, I think. It probably reflects the, uh, the different patient population. Um, and um, so a, lo a lot of work to do. And, and going back to the variants, I mean, this is where monoclonal antibody-based therapies are probably far more vulnerable to the impact of variants than, uh, let's say, vaccines, because a monoclonal, by definition, is, yeah, right. is very specific. That's the beauty of it, but that's the vulnerability of it now also. So, again, we'll have to go to cocktails probably and so on. And uh, But we need that, and we need it not only for treatment, but also for, um, you know, as prophylaxis. I mean, you know, you can... Uh, it would be wonderful if you identify there will always be outbreaks of someone uh, in a care home or, or or in a workplace, wherever, in a household, is identified as being infected. And if uh, it's as long as not everybody's vaccinated, then you can apply, let's say, monoclonals as prophylaxis um, because they will act uh, basically immediately in terms of their antiviral property. Um, but we need... Um, yeah, we need far more work um, and far more systematic work. It's not going to be very, um, how to say, sexy in the sense. Uh, it reminds me in the early days when I was a medical student, like um, treating leuke leukemia in children. That was, was a, uh, you know, a death sentence. But it was like every trial or, or many trials, every time yeah. added like 5%, 10% survival, okay? With HIV also, yeah. it's... Uh, you know, it's it's kind of partly trial and error, partly rational approaches, and then a drug that it's a little bit better and so on. And maybe we are and in in that that stage now, and that's what's needed. But the problem is that time pressure is is enormous yeah. and people dying. I mean, the disease to me reminds me much more of sepsis. I mean, the critical care community we've been at it for twenty or thirty years, and there's been nothing magical. But yeah, yeah but. But yes. but mortality rates have come down. It's very different than diabetes or type one diabetes, yeah. where you need to give insulin, or if you have bacterial yes. meningitis, you need to give the appropriate yeah. antibiotic. It's not not that simple. Peter, yeah. you must you must have a particular interest. As I said, people know 
You've been public about having contracted the disease in March. And I've said on the show, someone emailed me, I don't know now, it could be four or five months ago, time is so odd at the last year, about long haulers. And I, I said to them, why are you writing me about truck drivers? I don't have any. And they go, no, no, we're not talking to you about truck drivers. We're talking to you about people are reporting these long term consequences of disease. Could you say a little bit uh, about your own experience and then your your sense of what the, this concept of a small number of people having prolonged symptoms may may look like or may what it may be? Yeah, well, I was one of these uh, long haulers, and I think it's not so rare. But before that, why did I could say come out? And that was because I got really very frustrated by the public messaging. Certainly here in the UK was all about statistics, uh, flattening the curve. Uh, we had prime minister giving, uh, explaining the reproductive rate of infectious diseases. Mm-hmm. My God, and then and then saving the NHS and then whole, and never about people. And I said, this is about people. And, 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 you know, and I worked for many years in, on AIDS. And so in, the, let's call it, in, in, in HIV, people living with HIV, they're a very important and, and, and uh, component of the AIDS movement or whatever. We, you know, they're outspoken and they, there is a base and said, OK, I'll, you know. I, and I started in, in, in Belgium because I'm from Belgium and uh, I'm pretty well known there. And there was a lot of complacency. And I said, look, this is not just about a little flu here and there. And then if you're very old or you have underlying conditions, then you end up in intensive care and 1% die and it's just 1% and, you know, and uh, I said, you know, there's a lot in between. And um, and that's that's why I, I came out. And also, um, this was in, in April um, last year, this long haul or long COVID was not yet known. I mean, right. I was at University College Hospital in London, and I was one of the first ones, uh, you know, with this, with the after. Uh, so I got infected uh, in, in, in March, one of, in, in the very beginning, um, uh, mid-March, uh, I got sick. And um, the after, uh, you know, it was just headache and uh, fever being very, I mean, but splitting headache and uh, very tired. Um, but I continued to work. I'm a bit of a workaholic, you know, and plus I was dealing with uh, the epidemic and, and uh, so on, and then also transforming our uh, the London school into a more digital working and all that. But then I just couldn't take it anymore, and I had to go to the hospital. I was hospitalized, and um, I had bacterial pneumonia, so I was treated for that, at least that we know. Um, but my oxygen saturation... The lowest value I had was 79%. And so I was admitted with 83%. But the, what's interesting is that I hadn't thought of it. I mean, it's of course when you're, you're your own worst doctor. Um, and um, because I had no shortage of breath. I mean, I live in one of those uh, old English houses with uh, three floors and I go up and down <laughs> all the time. And it's no problem. Yeah, that's your. Um, but this is silent hypoxia. Uh, you know, it was. Uh, I was uh, certainly one of them, but then I got very high flow oxygen and heparin because I had a racing tachycardia and actually developed uh, atrial fibrillation also, um, all related to the to COVID. And I'd never been sick in my whole life. I had no underlying conditions. So that's probably was good. I'm pretty fit, certainly for a 71 year old. and. Um, and but fortunately, I never had to be intubated or go into intensive care. Um, but I was always like at the limit for in terms of oxygen saturation. But then I was, uh, you know, discharged and uh, and I thought, OK, now I'm going to just have to rest, which is not my greatest quality. Um, and uh, a, a week later, I was uh, exhausted, exhausted. But then I started coughing, uh, being short of breath and then it's what I, I developed, uh, what they call here an organizing pneumonia, but they an interstitial pneumonia with some fibrosis. And I was treated with high doses of um, for IV, um, prednisolone, up to, uh, you know, one gram of a bolus of uh, wow. uh, prednisolone. Yeah, it gives you a bit of a funny feeling. Yeah, you were you. flying for a few days. 
Yeah, but no, I was very disappointed. I got, didn't get euphoric or anything. You didn't get your, no euphoria, Peter. No, but it was, uh, yeah. My head was already a bit, well, it was what I what's called a foggy head. I had that uh, for quite a while. So I had also cognitive involvement. I had hyperesthesia, so my head, just touching my hair was so painful. It was very interesting. Anyway, that took for about three months. Smell, um, loss of smell and taste, Peter, so common. No, fortunately not, because I love my wine and my food, you know, <laughs> I, uh, so I'm so grateful I never lost that. Okay. Uh, but I had no appetite, so I didn't touch wine for maybe three months, so, which is the longest in my life, I think, in my adult life. Um, but, um, yeah, and it took uh, about four months, five months uh, before, yeah, five months before I could start, uh, like, running again, slowly. And now I'm fine. Just totally fine, um, but um, except that I need eight to nine hours sleep. I shouldn't say except because I'm now reconciled that that's not a waste of time, but that's actually healthy. And that it's a book by Matthew Walker, um, Why We Sleep, that right. really, uh, you know, I said, okay, it's good for me. So now I'm, yeah, that's that's a new lifestyle. But um, yeah. uh, Quite a few questions have come in, so if we could just go through a few of them. One's sure. a difficult one. Peter, you're a globalist. I mean, your your careers uh, been to go to difficult places and help people. Um, I was impressed that President Biden has commented that he just purchased 300 million more doses from Pfizer and Moderna, but that that means there's not 300 million doses going to other countries, uh, low and middle income countries. Um, how do the rich countries, your country, our country, have to think about the world? Yeah, it's something oh, that uh, keeps me really busy. It's probably what keeps me awake at night now more than anything else. I mean, at the same level as the variants. And that is the, um, let's say, vaccine inequity. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I've been, you know... Uh, talking a lot to my colleagues, friends in, in Africa, where uh, there is now rampant uh, COVID epidemic. That was one of the surprises. I thought it would start yeah. very early on, and it didn't. It didn't. It la- waited. But now it's up. You know, we, uh, John Kengason from the director of Africa Centers for Disease Control just, uh, uh, you know, talked also about uh, the mortalities going up. But yesterday, uh, it was announced that uh, by the African Union that they had... Um, uh, secured, and I can't remember the exact uh, number, but uh, 300 or is it 600 doses of vaccine from the Serum Institute of India and so on. But it is a problem. This is not only a moral hazard, a moral issue, but um, and, and one of the, what I think will be one of the big geopolitical issues of our time. Just imagine a world where, you know, the Western world and the, and the richer Asian countries um, are all we're secured against the COVID-19 and then um, the poor countries not. Um, that's not only unfair, but it's also, uh, we should be very uh, clear there, this problem is not going to be solved until it's solved in every single country. You can have be in New Zealand and, and, you know, and close off your country because you're an island, and, uh, but you can't do that forever. And you'll have to do that forever if the whole world is not safe. So it's in our interest. And I hope that we will have some initiatives to support, uh, you know, low-income countries. And that's why I was working with um, an initiative that was originally launched by Ursula von der Leyen of the European Union. And that led to the creation of COVAX. It's now led by Gavi, the uh, Vaccine Alliance, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, and with you know, backing from WHO, and that is really uh, trying to to buy uh, vaccines for low-income countries. But the African Union hasn't waited for that and has done their own deals. Um, but at the moment, the big issue, I think, is that we have to make sure that we are sh- going to share some of our vaccines. And secondly, um, that we provide the money for it. And I think we need a... Um, and then that there is enough uh, vaccines manufactured because that is another issue. Uh, but that's uh, going to be a temporary problem, I think. I, I, I'm quite confident that by the third quarter of the year, there will be 
um, really billions of doses coming up and certainly near the end of the year. But that's still a long time. And let's not forget that we have a couple of million people who died in, you know, in less than a year, basically. Uh, we can't afford that. So it's very high on the agenda. And I hope that the Biden administration, perhaps joining forces with the EU and other countries to launch an initiative so that there are going to be vaccines available for everybody because we're all going to suffer, everybody. Yeah, I, I think for many people, uh, uh, we talk about equity. Sometimes it's hard to live equity. It, it, it's, yeah. uh, uh, last question, uh, and it uh, again, it came across uh, the screen. Um, have you been vaccinated, Peter, and should you be vaccinated? Yeah, first, yes, uh, about uh, three weeks ago now, I got the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. I mean, I just uh, on a Saturday afternoon, I was called by my uh, uh, GP practice, you know, and they said, yeah, can you come tomorrow at 9.45 in a health center? Uh, for a vaccine and I said sure but I said I'm not over 80 because in the UK it's healthcare workers and care home workers and then it's first people over 80 and now they're starting over 70 and so on. and they said come tomorrow and so okay and and you don't know which vaccine it was uh, you know I got a Pfizer BioNTech I, mean, I was happy with that 95% protection and, um, and so the nurse explained to me that, um, you know, there were not enough people registered already for the shot so that they, they went to the next tier, yes. And the question I, I, I also wonder myself, uh, do I need a vaccine? Yeah. In, in my case, it's, pro, it's a boost, probably. I mean, okay. a, a boost. Um, but at some point, uh, I was concerned, maybe you can have immune enhancement, uh, infection and so on. I mean, the, all these theoretical possibilities. But then I was quite satisfied by the, uh, you know, the safety profile that looked into that. And uh, I'm not just keen that I'm getting my second um, injection within six weeks and not 12 weeks. But, uh, but I think that um, we will have data also uh, soon, I believe, from uh, the, not only the trials, but from vaccine deployment, like in Israel, where yeah. Oh, they're really ahead of anybody else and they're uh, rigorously following and monitoring people and a lot of people vaccinated must have had the infection because frankly we, we have the official data from WHO and so on but they're pretty meaningless you know they're probably close to a billion people who have already been infected with this virus um, so a lot of those vaccinated are gonna, uh, you know will have had the infection so that will be very interesting to see. Um, but the fact is also that we can be reinfected. I mean, it seems to be rare, but maybe with this, uh, you know, variants and the more diverse they are, maybe the higher the risk for reinfection. That's another um, research question that uh, I'm, I'm very keen to see an answer to. And that will take, I guess, in a few months time, we will know the answer to that. Yeah, no, sadly, in the U.S., given the numbers, of uh, cases over the last uh, f few months, we're probably close to 15% of the U.S. population has now been infected. So that, you yeah. know, we're 330 million. So that means 50 million people in some regards have some protection, not everyone, but oh, yeah. most have protection for some some period of time. Oh, I, yeah. I always have one last question, but this will be the last question. I apologize, Peter. When the new vaccines, say, say some new vaccines are approved in the coming months and they're 60 percent or 70 percent effective versus Pfizer and Moderna, 95 percent. How do you think that's going to play out in the public? Yeah, and that's, uh, I think, uh, a reality. I mean, look at the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. OK, we it's not totally clear how much, but they say average 70 percent. Right. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, although I must say, when it comes to severe disease, mortality, the, day, the, the numbers were too small, but, but severe disease and mortality, it seems that effectiveness is, is really high. For AstraZeneca. And, uh, I didn't see the data for AstraZeneca. Yes. I mean, the numbers are small, of course, okay. when it comes to mortality. And we haven't seen the final reports from the China vaccines, no. but, but the preliminary Indeed. data say lower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. 
and and that in itself will be very very important and i think that we should stress that and so the the first impact of vaccination should be seen in terms of mortality and severe disease hospitalization and uh, frankly that would make a whole difference i mean okay we may continue to become infected but if you don't end up in the hospital and you don't die okay that's fantastic but um in terms of the um you know vaccine confidence uh, that uh, that will require some good communication, and I think we need to distinguish between people who are, let's say, hardcore anti-vaxxers who are against vaccination because they want it the natural way or whatever. They're against big pharma and so on, and, and they prefer that their kids get encephalitis and so on, and you know, or die. But most people who hesitate, I think, they have questions. You know, they say, uh, "How can? How do we know?" Uh, within 10 months, whether this is so totally safe and efficacy. So it's something where we need to make sure that we are transparent in everything that happens um, and that we uh, are, you know, listening to people. Uh, my wife, Heidi Larson, she uh, happens to work a lot on that. So I hear a lot about that at home, uh, you know, for on vaccine confidence. It's not just by giving more information and we need to take people seriously. And it's a particularly an issue, uh, I don't know what the U.S., but in, here in this country, um, in, in, in black communities uh, and in other ethnic minorities, that there is quite some suspicion. And yet they may need more than anybody else because there is also a lot of inequality in face of death in terms of COVID because we've seen it in ethnic minorities in the U.S. and in, uh, and in the U.K. So... Um, yeah, it's not over, and uh, I also don't believe that we will go back to totally normal in a few months' time. Um, we'll, we'll probably have a, a gradual uh, expansion of vaccine uh, uh, coverage with uh, fewer and fewer people dying. Wonderful, but we will need to keep some of the, um, you know, the other measures and certainly wearing masks and so on. That's what I'm going to continue to do in any case. This is Howard Bachner, uh, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. This has been Conversations with Dr. Bachner, and what a privilege. Peter Piat is the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a legendary school in public health, founded in 1899, where he's the HANA Professor of Global Health. Peter, thanks uh, for sharing your wisdom, your insight, and your personal stories. I, I think we should never, ever uh, forget the power of narrative in trying to explain uh, prevention and disease to people. Thanks, Peter, for joining me today. Thanks, Howard. Pleasure. Stay healthy.